Hello everybody, this is Mr. Steele once again. I'm bringing you the fifth and final lesson from this unit focused on analysis using differentiation and calculus techniques. In this lecture, we're going to be focusing our attention on a particular type of analysis, a really common type of analysis that shows up that begins in kind of an interesting place and, you know, I might even call it indirect characterization if I was in an English class. To start things off though, before I even talk about what it is we're going to do today, I just want to kind of prepare you for the challenge of what's about to be here. And the way I want to do that is with this kind of contrived starting point that focuses first on a function f of x. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, so far in this unit, we've focused on trying to determine and analyze and describe the behavior and properties of a function f of x. We've tried to figure out how we can determine where that function is increasing, decreasing, where it has a relative maximum or minimum, or possibly even neither, where there's a point of inflection and where the concavity is, as well as changes. So there's a ton of information built in here, but at the end of the day, every single time we've done one of these problems, we've been basically focusing on a picture like this and trying to use properties and tools like differentiation to tell us what's actually happening, or specifically where it's happening there. So in here, for instance, like if we just think back to some of the work that we've done so far, something I could ask you is, where is this function concave up? Like that's the sort of thing I could ask. And at the end of the day, even though we have tools to help us get there involving like the second derivative, in a sense, when you see the picture of f of x, you can very clearly confirm where that is. We see the functions concave up right there and definitely concave up right there. In fact, some of you may even be thinking about second derivative test, the presence of those relative minimums, like corresponding with second derivative being positive. And then of course, like the only thing that's missing is we'd have to figure out where those points of inflection fall. But you know, it could be as simple as some of those nice values, although probably not, but we would just need something to help us find those specific values. But the nice thing is, is it's very clear looking at our picture where this function is concave up. There's going to be two intervals where that happens. Likewise, if I asked you for where there's a relative maximum, you'd be all over that. You're like, oh, my uncle maximum's right over here. That's my relative maximum and you'd be able to point to it. It's very easy to see. Even if we're using other tools to get there, it's very easy to see everything we're talking about here. So in other words, when you're analyzing a function f of x and you have the function f of x, there's always this really nice correspondence of being able to physically see what it is that you're working on, and then just supporting it using the derivative or the second derivative, whatever the case may be. The big difference is today, we are going to still be analyzing f of x, so that's going to remain our goal. Like this is actually going to serve as a really nice wrap up and finishing point for this unit. So we are still going to analyze f of x. In fact, we'll go with a little check mark here. But the difference is we are no longer going to have f of x. And when I say that, I mean that in the sense of we're not going to have a picture. We're not going to be able to say f of x equals some sort of polynomial of some kind or some sort of expression. So don't get excited there either. We're basically not going to know anything basically about f of x. What we're going to start with is in a completely different place. We're going to be given some information about the function provided in a very particular form, which we'll talk about in just a second. And our job will be to use the definitions that we have for properties like increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down, maximum, minimum, point of inflection, and to reason from that point forward into information about the function f of x. So in a sense, I called this earlier indirect characterization. And my thought process here is that when you're reading a novel, say, and there is direct characterization, that's when the author tells you something about the character. Like, Tom was short. You know that Tom was short. Or Tom had a mean streak about him. You're being told directly something about that person or that character. In indirect characterization, you see it through the behavior of the character, or by what the character does, like sorts of actions without being told directly, he's a bad guy. So in this case, like our lesson today is going to focus on using indirect characterization to determine some information about a function f of x, or maybe even go through and figure out what the graph of f of x itself looks like. The difference is, I'm not going to tell you anymore. You're not going to be told, if you look at it that way. You're not going to be told what f of x is or looks like. You're going to be given information about some property involving f of x and have to derive your understanding of the character of f of x from that information. 
So as we jump in here, keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to be given information about a function, but not the function itself, what it looks like or what it is. And we're going to have to determine some information about that function. Now, as a good place to begin that work, it's nice to remind you of what it is that we know so far about sort of function analysis. And in a sense, I think this paper will be distributed to you, so you can keep an eye out for it. In a sense, this is the work that we've done up to this point, establishing a set of definitions, basically, for all the different properties that a function might have. And I think this really is a pretty um, encompassing set of, I guess, rules would be the word or whatever you might want to do. And so, for instance, this gives us lots of information. Now, it's not completely exhaustive because I didn't put like f of x sub 2 is greater than f of x sub 1 for x sub 2 greater than x sub 1 um, in a definition like increasing. But at the same time, what I want to point out here is with all of these properties that we might want to analyze for a given function, increasing, decreasing, relative maximum, relative minimum, concave up, concave down, point of inflection, and of course, critical number, kind of the grandfather of them all. I want to point out that every single one of these features a particular I don't know what the exact word is I want to say. They all feature something in common. Notice on increasing and decreasing, they both mention f prime. f prime is positive, f prime is negative. f prime changes positive to negative. f prime changes negative to positive. f prime is increasing, f prime is decreasing. f prime changes from between decreasing and increasing. f prime equals zero or undefined. Every single one of these things can be described using f prime. So our goal here today, and what we're gonna be working through is we're gonna focus on those properties. We're gonna focus on the fact that you can basically tell anything you want to, almost everything, about a function by the behavior of its derivative. So the thought process goes, even if we don't know what f of x is, if we have good information, like sound information and comprehensive information about the function f prime of x, in other words, the slope function for that function, we should be able to very clearly determine what's happening on f of x and maybe even go backwards and construct what f of x looks like or actually is equal to. So our goal today as we start, I kind of keep this in your mind as well, our goal is to use the graph or information about f prime of x and I will say it is usually a graph. That's going to be our focal point here. Either the graph or we're going to give you information so you can find a graph. We're going to use f prime of x to understand f of x. And again, this might seem like it's kind of out of left field, but this is a really common thing, actually. When we think about something as simple as just driving a car, oftentimes you might not know your literal like position at a given moment. You aren't, your car doesn't spit out for you your longitude and latitude all the time, although nowadays phones probably can with GPS and stuff, but set aside that part. Instead, what you know is how fast you're moving. You know your rate of change because you can have that speedometer in front of you that tells you that information. In a sense, a rate of change or the rate at which something is changing is something that can be easily measured. So if we have information about the rate of change for a given function or behavior, then oftentimes we want to be able to run backwards from that information to describe the overall um, function itself. So again, it's really a big stretch. This is something pretty important you're going to do a lot. So bear with me. It feels a little error as you're starting it out. But keep in mind what our goal is here, is to use indirect characterization in the form of the first derivative, f prime of x, to determine some information about f of x. And our tools, our toolbox, is going to be what's right over here. We're going to be using f prime of x almost all the time to do this. So given that, let's jump into the first problem and try to give you some context here. Because I will say this can sometimes make you feel a little uncomfortable. It's a little bit weird to go through and not talk about f in the same way. Um, and to start in kind of a different place, but I think you're going to be able to get really good at it, and I think you'll be successful. So without further ado, here we go into our first full example. So this should be handed to you. I think this problem was printed for you already. I'm hoping that's what it is. I'll try to make sure that's that case. But basically where we're going to begin is with a graph. And so you might start to think that I am a lar because of the fact that I told you literally we're not going to have a graph of f. But the truth is, we are not looking at a graph of f of x right now. Instead, we are given the graph of f prime of x. In other words, what we have graphed here, like what you're going to be looking at with this function, is a graph of f prime of x, the derivative f of x. And of course, since we know derivative is just key for slope, that means this graph that we're looking at represents the slope of the graph of f of x. 
So for instance, anywhere where we see this graph of f prime cross zero means it's going to be a place where the slope of the tangent line would be zero. Likewise, high points correspond to maximum slope values or minimum slope values, like small or high values that the slope, the slope actually attains at different points. Our job then is to take this bit of information that comes in this visual package and to move forward and determine all the behaviors of f of x without ever seeing f of x. And then finally at the end, once we've done that, we'll go back through and we'll reconstruct the graph of f of x. So this is going to feel really weird because throughout this entire lecture and throughout the work that you'll do with derivative and graph analysis that we're focusing on today, you're going to be looking at one picture and using it to describe another picture. Like it feels a little bit weird, but it's going to be something you'll get comfortable with if you get comfortable with these definitions that we've been looking at all this time. So sit back, relax. If you need to pause the video, please do and try to seek some clarification. But I'm going to work my way through here and try to ground it every single time in meaning and definition so that that way we can move forward with this technique. Okay, so again, we're looking at a graph of the slope for some function f of x. And so our job is to move through and try to determine what we know about f based on this information. So down here, and consider these like a, b, c, d, etc. Like those parts of the question, what you're asked are for some properties. So first, for instance, you're asked to find the critical numbers of f of x. So in order to find critical numbers, you might think about first how we actually determine where a critical number is. And going back one step, we said critical numbers occur when f prime of c equals 0 or f prime of c does not exist. So in looking here, we're going to have to justify each answer. So we're going to have to give a reason for everything that we do here. So it's worth pointing out that when you get started, a good way to begin is to focus on what it means to be a critical number of f and to focus on the fact that we want to use f prime of x. So first of all, if we have critical numbers of the function f of x, those occur when f prime of x equals zero. So our goal here is to find the places where f prime of x equals zero. Now we know that there are other ways to find critical numbers. In particular, we can find places where there are horizontal tangent lines on the graph of f. We can look for places where f has a relative extremum because those automatically correspond to critical numbers. But keep in mind the tool that we're provided here. We are given f prime of x. We are given information about f prime. So we need to use f prime to draw our conclusions. Otherwise, we're not making good use of the tool that we're provided. It's like one of my favorite phrases. You may not find this funny. I still find it hilarious. It's like you've ever heard the phrase, when life gives you lemons. Well, if I say when life gives you lemons, you know to say then make lemonade. Well, exactly, because you're given lemons. If you're given lemons, use the lemonades to make the lemons to make something like lemonade. When life gives you lemons, don't make beef stroganoff because lemons aren't in that. I don't think actual kitchen knowledge may vary. So instead, we want to use f prime of x. So there we go. We've determined that critical numbers occur when f prime of x equals zero per the definition of critical numbers. Now it's just a matter of us finding those locations. It looks to me like I see one right there. I see one right there and I see one right there. So those critical numbers will occur at three different x values, specifically x equals negative two, x equals three, and x equals four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are three critical numbers for f because there are three places where the derivative of f is equal to zero. So again, we're using that thing that we have, f prime of x, to determine information about f of x. So we have three potential relative maxima or minima at those three values. So there's our first move. Again, just using a definition and then drawing it out from there. Pretty simple, almost a review, I think. So on the next one, we want to know on what interval is f increasing? Well, again, we know lots of things about increasing. Specifically, we know what it even looks like on a function. But remember, we're looking at f prime of x here. So if f is increasing, that occurs when f prime of x is greater than or equal to zero. Right? That's what increasing means. The derivative is positive, or at least it's not negative. So we want to figure out where f prime is greater than or equal to zero. Well, we normally want to say things like right there, because notice the graph is getting bigger. But the problem is, this isn't a graph of f of x. We're looking at a graph of the slope. So just because the function is growing doesn't mean necessarily that the actual function f of x is growing. Instead, we want f prime of x to be greater than or equal to zero which means f prime 
is basically positive or zero. So in our case what we're looking for is where the graph of f prime is above the x-axis. And looking at that I see that that occurs right here and also that it occurs right here. So right up above the x-axis we have positive f prime which means that this is the regions or these are the regions where f is increasing because f prime or the slope is positive. So in here we're going to say that this occurs on two intervals. It's going to occur on it looks like negative two to three and it's also going to occur on I think we said eight two sideways eight also known as infinity. So there are our intervals. I mean, it might be nice if I put x as a member of but we're past that. So there are the two intervals on which the graph of f is increasing. And again, we didn't have to see f to determine that. We just looked for where the slope was positive, or non-negative in our case. So moving on to the third question here. The third question asks, naturally, on what intervals is f decreasing? Well, we can probably follow the pattern at this point. We know the definition of decreasing, or the one that's easiest to work with, calculus-wise, is that f prime of x is less than or equal to 0. In other words, we're looking for where f prime is negative, or zero, but we'll set that aside. It's almost like I'm talking in terms of strictly, whatever. So in other words, we're looking for where the graph of f prime is less than zero. So just like before, if we have negative f prime, that means that this is the region where f is decreasing. And looking at our picture, we've got a whole heck of a lot of places, well, specifically two, where f prime is negative. So specifically, it looks like we're gonna be on the intervals it's going to be from negative infinity to negative 2. And then it's also going to be from 3 to 8. And there are our two intervals where the graph of f is apparently decreasing. And our reasoning, once again, is because f prime of x is negative. So again, this is going to feel weird the first time because what you see is not necessarily what you get. Like that picture definitely doesn't look like it's decreasing right here. I can, I can understand that. But again, our goal here is to use this information provided by f prime of x in the form of a graph to draw out and indirectly characterize what f of x is doing on those intervals. And we've just accomplished that. Moving forward, we've talked about increasing and decreasing. A natural follow-up from there is to figure out where f has relative maximum or relative minimum. Just kind of a natural follow place. So the first question, next question we want to ask, we don't need to ask why because we said we had to justify it. Let's get rid of those. Our next question is to ask at what x values does f have a relative maximum? And again, hold your horses. I know you're excited by looking at this and want to go, yay, high point. But no, that's not a high point of f. We're again looking at a picture of the slope or the rate of change of f of x. These things, it is not what it appears. We must be careful here as we analyze. So in looking at our picture, it's worth giving ourselves some context first. If f is going to have a relative maximum, relative maximum on f, a relative maximum on f looks like this. That implies that f has to go from increasing to decreasing, which is all hunky-dory and good, except for the fact that we don't have f, like we have f prime. So quick translation, we know that f prime then must go from positive to negative. So our goal here is going to be to find the places, aka justify our answer, by looking for the places where f prime of x changes from positive to negative. And I'm going to write out the words this time, what the heck. So this is what we're looking for in determining where f of x has relative maximum or relative minimum. We want to see that the slope goes positive then stops going positive and switches to negative because that would indicate, of course, increasing, stopping, and decreasing. So in looking at our picture here, let's see, we want f prime to go from positive to negative. So this is positive f prime, and down here is negative f prime. Looking at our picture, we want positive to negative. I am positive that it only occurs at this point. So specifically, we should have one relative maximum at x equals 3. And our reasoning is, again, by the definition, or the first derivative test if you want to, because f prime of x changes from positive to negative there. And we found our one value. So the analogous one would be to look at relative minimum. So once again, we could go through and talk like we just did. 
could say that our reasoning for having a relative minimum on f would be because f prime changes from negative to positive. In other words, f is decreasing, then it stops decreasing as it hits its lowest point, and then begins increasing. So to wrap this one up, we need to look for where f prime of x changes from negative to positive. And again, we're basically looking for the other two critical numbers, as it turns out here. So I see one spot right there, because f prime is negative right down here, and then positive right afterwards. And then I see one more over here at x equals 8. So I'm going to say that there are two in this case, at x equals negative 2 and x equals 8. And our reasoning is because f prime changes from negative to positive. Exactly the first derivative test in both cases here. So and again, these aren't the only ways you could justify it, but they're the ways that are best because we're actually using the tool that we were provided, right? It's given to us. We got that picture of f prime. We're justifying with f prime. Okay, now, tough part comes next. We're interested in figuring out where, for instance, f is concave up. And we're used to very quickly saying that f is concave up where f double prime is positive. And while that's still a valid definition, it's still a valid justification, it doesn't help us because we don't have f double prime. That's like saying, like, oh man, I'm the greatest pie maker in the world. If I just had the greatest chocolate in the history of humankind, I'd be able to make that pie. Well, that might be true. It's not. I'm terrible at stuff like that. But there's a big problem because you don't have that chocolate. So instead, we want to focus on the tools that we have, not just wax poetically and pine for tools that we don't have. So instead, I'm going to focus my attention on f prime and ask myself, what does it mean for f to be concave up based on the derivative f prime? In other words, what is the derivative doing as f when f is concave up? Well, we could go back to yesterday's lecture or we could just kind of bring it up right here. It says so right in this spot. It says f is concave up when f prime is increasing. Remember, we saw that. If we draw and sketch out one of these functions, we have negative slope, then we have zero slope, then we have positive slope that keeps getting st steeper. So in other words, we want f prime to be increasing. So this might be the one thing you really have to kind of like stick into your head a little bit. Our reasoning here for where f is concave up using f prime of x is going to be anywhere where f prime of x is increasing. It's just different because now that's an easy thing for us to see. We have a graph of f prime of x. We can visually see where it is increasing. So looking at our picture for concave up, f prime is increasing here, here, and here. So it looks like there are three intervals where it's happening. So f is concave up on negative infinity to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Looks like negative 6. It's also on, looks like negative 5 to 1. And it also looks like 3, 4, 5. 5 to infinity. I guess it's a little cramped down here. I'm sorry, I'll try to fix that. But in any event, there is our justification. There. So we determined where f is concave up based on where f prime is increasing. Now, following similar suit, if we want to talk about where f is concave down, you can imagine that that's going to be where f prime of x is decreasing. And again, that we saw that that was true if we, when we did the concavity lesson, f prime decreasing corresponds to f being concave up, meaning that the slope is getting smaller and smaller, or sorry, concave down. So again, it starts positive, goes to zero, then it becomes negative and steeper and steeper. So this definitely looks like f prime is negative. As far as our graph, pretty easy to see. It's going to be the other regions here. Turns out there are two of them. Looks like this is going to occur on negative 6 to negative 5, as well as, what is that, 1, 2, 5. So two separate intervals for x, where f is concave down. And again, we still haven't seen a picture of f. We still haven't looked at it one time. We don't know what f looks like at all but yet we're able to tell all the important characteristics of f based on the derivative. The derivative is our key here to kind of opening up that world. Again, indirectly characterizing everything that we have. You know what, here, I'm just gonna move this over. So this does bring us to our final little piece of information that we're being asked in this question. 
and that is at what x values does f have a point of inflection? So points of inflection are actually somewhat tough to see on an actual, in an actual problem. So I'm sure I'm gonna use that color. Right, dang. I'm trying to find another color. So points of inflection are actually pretty um, difficult to see sometimes. Remember, there are places where f changes concavity. So there's something where we visually have to kind of approximate it. Although we did say that slides tend to have the points of inflection in there really nicely. So keep that in mind as we think. The difference here is we're looking for values of f prime of x, like we're talking about f prime and trying to draw information about f's points of inflection. So going back one more step, again, this will be something you'll get used to at the beginning is to start here. It says that we have a point of inflection when f prime changes from decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing. So one thing I'm going to point out, I think I talked about it a little bit the last time or in yesterday's lesson, but just to be safe, we're looking for places where f prime changes. And in this case, it's going to be changing from either decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing. I don't want to have to say that because that's a lot of words to have to say four different words like that. So instead, I'm going to say f prime changes between increasing and decreasing. So that way, we don't have to go through the trouble of trying to, what's the word I'm looking for? We don't have to go through the trouble of restating it both different ways. This way we're covered in every event. So for this last one, we're looking for the places where f prime of x, or we're going to say that they occur because f prime of x changes between be a good time to introduce the abbreviation for between, but whatever. F prime of x changes between increasing and decreasing. So again, that just saves us some trouble. Otherwise, you could change, say f prime changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Like you'd need to include that phrase or vice versa to make sure that you cover all bases. Now in our case, if f prime is changing between increasing and decreasing, what we're really describing are the relative extrema of our derivative graph. So there's going to be a point of inflection right there, a point of inflection right there, one at one, and one right there. So in looking at our p information here, we're going to have, it looks like four of them. There's gonna be one at x equals negative six, at negative five, at one, and it looks like two, three, four, five, and at x equals five. So there turn out to be four points of inflection. And again, our reason for getting there, we don't have f double prime available for us to be able to say, f double prime changes signs because that would be a nice way to do it. Since we have f prime of x, we use f prime and say that it's because f prime changes between increasing and decreasing. So again, I know it's a lot, this indirect characterization like world that we're working through, but basically you can kind of get the gist of what we're working on here. We're giving you the derivative or information about the derivative or literally a graph of the derivative of some function f and we're asking you to tell us everything you can about f of x. And in fact, we get really everything about f of x, save for one thing, but we won't get to what that one thing is until term three. So there is a demonstration that includes one of every little part here. So take a moment for that to sink in, and then we'll start working on um, some other examples in just a second. Okay, now that we've looked at all the information and used f prime of x to analyze this function f of x for, for quite some time here, I want to actually do something that you're not going to be asked to do explicitly, but that sometimes can be helpful, and more important than that, in this case, is going to be really instructive. Now that we know all this information about f of x, can we actually sketch out and figure out what f of x looks like? And the answer is yes, within reason. Like Technically, what we'll learn in the second half of the course is that we actually are missing one key piece of information, what we'll then call an initial condition that tells us what point, a single point that f of x goes through. But for the moment, let's set that aside and let's just work on this analytically. And in fact, once I've done this by hand, I'm gonna go through and show you on Desmos um, that this actually works out. It's reasonable, at least. We can sketch a reasonable approximation of what f of x would look at based on the loose information we have about its derivative f prime of x. So for us to get started here, what I wanna begin with is I wanna first go through and identify some combinations here. So a couple things to point out. First, that's f prime of x below. This is f of x above. So this is our original function that we're gonna be looking at right here. I'm gonna eventually gonna graph it in black. For the moment though, what I wanna do is I wanna kinda of make some connections here between the stuff that we have and the analysis information that we have. So what I wanna do first is I wanna go through and identify where on the original function we're going to have 
the relative extrema, just because relative extrema are so important for getting the shape of a function down. I'm going to move this down, you'll see why in a second. So first of all, we said that there was going to be a relative maximum at x equals 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to draw this up just so that I know that somewhere along this line we're going to have a relative maximum. So let me see if I can make this a little straighter. Yes, almost. There we go. Close enough. So there's where we're going to have our relative maximum. Likewise, we're going to have relative minima at negative 2. Let's see, I'm so good. Okay, this is not going well. Not very good at drawing these straight lines. Okay, there's going to be a relative minimum right there. Let's see if we can come on. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Copy that, in fact. So there's going to be a min right here, according to our analysis. Okay, you can see I'm kind of cheating here and copying some stuff out. There's also going to be a minimum right here near the end. So make sure to get that guy in there as well. See, the graphs aren't perfectly scaled, but close enough. So there's going to be a relative minimum there. In addition, we're going to have points of inflection, which are going to be kind of hard to draw. I'm not going to lie to you. They will be a little bit tougher for us to work through, but it's nice to have them. So we're going to have points of inflection, places where f is going to change concavity at each of these values. So let's straighten this out a little bit first. Write POI up here. So you can kind of see what I'm doing is I'm laying a bunch of foundation here first, so that that way I'll have some hope of getting this picture correct. Again, this is definitely not an easy thing to do. So we've got five, negative 5 and negative 6, I think, both. Yes. Then we've got 1. So it's going to have to be a, relative, or a point of inflection here. And then last but not least, we're going to have one at 5. It looks like we might need a little bit of... There we go. Okay, so we've got that. Everything else from here, we're just going to try to follow... The graph width. Should I use that? It's kind of thick. Let's go a little bit less thick. Can I do it that way? Yes, there we go. Okay, so our job here we want to construct the graph of f from information about f prime of x. As of right now, it just looks like some kind of multicolored matrix like thing. It's just all these lines coming down. But let's see if we can do this now. So forgive me for squinting. Um, I think I've explained what's up with my glasses in one of the video solutions. So in here, looking, first and foremost, we want to talk about increasing and decreasing. So on the first interval we're looking at here, f is decreasing from negative infinity to negative 2. And at first, it says f is concave up. So we've got to change concavity every single time, and then we've got to maintain all those pieces. So let's see if we can do this. So decreasing and concave up, then it's got to change to concave down, then it's got to switch to concave up, all the way until it hits its minimum, stays concave up, it's going to stay concave up for a while, then it's going to hit a point of inflection, so it's going to go concave down, reach a maximum, still concave down, now that it hits a point of inflection, it's going to switch to concave up, it's going to reach a minimum, and then stay that way. So this, my friends, is one reasonable approximation of the graph of f of x. And I will say, I, I can't deny the fact that this is a little bit hard to see here. Like, I can admit that it's sometimes hard to tell if we did this right. But based on what we saw, it appears concave up, concave down, concave up, clearly a minimum. Then we have a concave down, then we have concave up again. So it looks like our concavity switched. We do go decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, which definitely matches what we had here. And then finally, we seem to have the mins and maxes in the right spot. Now again, we don't know anything about scaling here. Like notice that our y-axis was never labeled on our derivative graph. So we don't know if the slope is 100 or like 3 or even 1 third. For all we know, it could be any of those things. So we don't know the exact sizes, but this is what I'm expecting. This sort of like curvy W kind of shape. And in fact, if we think about this in terms of polynomials, like pretend for a second that this is a polynomial, this is a positive bowl, or sorry, a positive noodle, is it not? The one up above it, the derivative, 
is a positive bowl. And that should make sense, right? If this is like, say, degree 6, the derivative would be still positive, but a degree 5 or noodle instead. So given that, let me just kind of illustrate to you. This isn't a perfect exact um, approximation of it. But for instance, here is the graph of f prime of x. And again, maybe not the most perfect thing in the world. I'm not going to lie there. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to see. But notice it does hit it. It has a little high and a low below the x-axis. It increases up there, hits the maximum on the right, goes down below, and then comes back up again. So there is f prime of x, the graph that we've seen or approximated on here. Here is the graph of f of x. You tell me, does this look reasonable? So again, not perfect because the relative scope of like how far I went down on everything is different. But notice, concave up, concave down for a short time, concave up, concave down, concave up. Everything appears to fit nicely. So basically the red graph is the slope of that function and the blue graph is the actual function itself. So which I realize now reversed what we had there. But so what you can see, again, this isn't perfect. It's not the greatest thing in the world to see. Like I can't convince you either because I'm not showing you how it is that I got that original function from there. Not even labeling the points for you. But again, the important thing here is to let you see that in fact, this work that we're doing is getting an ac it is painting an accurate picture of f of x. It's just indirectly described. We have to do a little bit of interpretation and we have to know some stuff about what these properties of the derivative mean about f in order to construct or even just describe and understand the properties of the function f of x. So again, give you a moment to think that through and then we'll look at a second example using a calculator. Okay, moving forward, as I said, I wanted us to look at um, just one more big example then I'll let you guys try one and then get you a head start on everything else. What I want to look at is sort of like how we might ask to throw some extra wrinkles into this question. And oftentimes there's not a lot that we can do as far as the analysis portion. Like you'll see some good variety on your problems so tonight. But for the most part, where things change is the format through which we give you information about the function. In this case, we're giving you f prime of x as a function. Like we know this is the derivative for some function f of x. But we need to figure out some information about that function f that we don't see once again. So we're providing you an f prime of x explicitly. Now in this particular question, it doesn't say it in the problem, but this is a calculator active question. So keep in mind, that's why when you look at that function f prime of x, you can't just quickly figure out in your head, oh, let me just figure out what function has that derivative. There may not actually be a closed form function that has this beautiful derivative or kind of crunchy derivative, if I'm being honest. So in here, what we want to do is we want to rely on the ability of our graphing calculator to render for us a graphical representation of this function, or at least in this case, this function's derivative. So to help us out, I'm going to go up to my graphing calculator, my friendly neighborhood graphing calculator. I'm going to put in as y1 f prime of x. So that looks like 4 sine of x. This is multiplied times 2 to the cosine of x. And all of that is subtracted by 3. So this should be our function, but we are told to focus on x values between 0 and 7. So I'm going to go ahead and put in 0 to 7 here. And then otherwise, I don't know, let's put negative 10 to 10 just for standardness. And let's see what this looks like. Does this get us a good picture of the function? Okay, yeah, I'll take that. I like that one. I think that does a really nice job of letting us see what this function looks like. So, or at least what this function's derivative looks like. Got to keep careful with what I say. Okay, so there is... There is the piece that we're looking for. Perfect. So there's what we're looking at. We want to analyze f of x based on this picture, which offers us the graph of f prime of x, also known as y1 of x. So in looking at our questions, we'll just reference this graph, and then we'll use the graph and calculator to find the values themselves. I don't think that'll be that difficult. It just adds that extra layer of using the graph and calculator. So the first one, part A. Part A instructs us to find the x-coordinates of each local extremum. So local extremum occur when f prime changes between positive and negative, or changes from positive to negative. So I'm looking here, I see one right there, and one right there, and one right there. So now looking at our picture, we have positive slope when the graph is above and negative slope below. So the first zero that we see and the last zero we see are both going to change from negative to positive. So for those, I'm going to first put in here, because f prime of x changes negative to positive. 
And again, our graphing calculator will then go find those values. So with that in place, it's going to cover up part of it, sorry. F prime is changing from negative to positive. So we go to second trace, go to the Widdler button. We'll go 0 to 2. And then we'll go guess that it's at 1. Looks like our first 0 is 0 0.408. So... And then there's one more here. Oops. There's one more here. So we'll go find the second zero. That's going to be, let's go from five to seven. And we'll guess six. So it says that's at 6.691. So we found our values. Now, what were we saying? If F prime changes from negative to positive, that means that F is going from decreasing to increasing, which means that we have a local min. So we have local min at x each of the, I'm not going to box it, I'm just not feeling the boxing. So we'll have local minima at 0 0.408 and 6.691 allegedly because f prime is changing from negative to positive there. So pretty standard work, a really common first question. And then likewise we can then talk about the fact that f prime changes from positive to negative there. So we can say that there is a local maximum at whatever that x value happens to be. And our reasoning would be because f prime changes from plus to minus. And you can see that as I'm getting more tired working through this, I'm starting to abbreviate things. Obviously, you know, make sure I understand exactly what's there. And of course, make sure that you actually say f prime and not things like slope or it. If you say it, Stephen King will sue you for copyright infringement. So be careful. So local max at whatever that x value is, let's go find it. So second trace, we'll again go find another zero. This one's kind of around two, so let's go 1.5 to 2.5. We'll guess that it happens at two. And it's at 1.908. And there we go. It looks like we have our local extrema figured out really nicely. So again, what was our key here? Our key was in figuring out and looking at the graph that our graphing calculator was able to provide. Okay, next, part B. Part B asks us to find all x for which f is increasing. Remember, f is increasing because f prime of x is greater than or equal to zero. So we're looking for where the graph of f prime is above the x-axis or on the x-axis. That occurs right there to there. And it also occurs at the very end. So we've got two little mini regions to go through. But the nice thing is we already found these values. This is 0 0.408. This one is 1.908. And this one is 6.691, if I'm reading this correctly. Yes. So from there, if we want to talk about where it's positive, it looks like it's positive for, let's see. Let's make sure I say this correctly. It's positive for 0 0.408 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1.908. And then there's also for 6.691, less than or equal to x, less than seven. So it looks like we have two separate regions where that occurs. We were just looking for where f prime was above the x-axis. And again, because we'd already found the zeros, that didn't take very long. And so we're able to get through really quickly. Okay, the third option on there, the green one, ask how many points of inflection do we have? And we've talked about points of inflection before. Points of inflection occur when F prime changes between increasing and decreasing. Or changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Decreasing, increasing and decreasing. So once again, we're looking for the relative extrema of this function. I see one right there and I see one right there. So let's go get our calculator involved and tell us what those max, what those little mini maxima or minimas are. So we'll start the maxima. We'll go from zero to two. We'll guess one. First one occurs at 1.034. And I just realized I don't actually even need to find these values, do I? Why is that? Because we were told to just count how many points of inflection there were. Well, I'm here. Maybe this information will be useful in a little bit. So we'll go with it. Four, seven, six. 
Okay, the other one's 5.24 or 250. 5.250. Okay, so it didn't ask, but there's enough for us to see that there are two points of inflection. So that was easier than I thought, but now we at least know those values in case it comes up. So those are in there. Again, something we're using, nothing too crazy so far. And then finally for part D, we're asked for which X is the graph of F concave down. Well, concave down, we determined earlier, occurs where F prime is decreasing. In other words, we want the slope to be decreasing. The slope begins as positive, then it goes to zero, right? All right. Why am I having trouble saying this right? Oh, sorry, it's concave down. Huh. So you can tell I'm tired. So decrease and starts positive, then it becomes negative. So F is concave down when F prime is decreasing. Looking at our picture, the only decreasing spot is right here. And because I instinctively went and found those X values where there were points of inflection, we can say for sure that F is concave down for the, I can't spell down, Daufer. down for the values between 1.034 and 5.250. And that's because F prime is decreasing. So with all this said, hopefully what you realized is looking at this calculator example, it was pretty intimidating, but the truth is it's really the exact same thing that we did earlier. We just had to use our graphing calculator to provide those values. We couldn't simply trace with our finger and figure out where those X values were. Now, before we go forward, just to kind of prove it, I'm going to go into my situation here and although I can't necessarily use the exact same tools as before we can't call it F again actually yes I can who am I to talk let's go in here let's go new blank graph okay so let's go F let's let Y equal G of X I'm gonna call it G so our function was this for sine of X sorry I got it type this in a little differently. What I want to show you is that we actually did find a good representation of our function. So we were interested in this for 0 to 7. So less than equal to x, less than equal to 7. Okay, so there's our function. Pretty nice little guy there. Nothing too out of the ordinary. Oh boy, computer's having trouble here. Okay, projector mode. Okay, so there's our function we're looking at. Now again, ignore the magic for a second. I want f to be this thing. This operation, which eventually we'll learn the meaning of, will take our function and figure out the original one. So why is this integration bounds can't be, oh, sorry. Okay, so this is supposedly our function f of x. Question is, does this look like an accurate picture? Well, it looks like our function here. Let's copy it in and take a look at it really briefly. I've got a few moments before I have to stop. Okay, so to analyze whether or not this looks like a reasonable move, looking at our picture of potential F, we have local, let's see, it should be increasing for values between, oh, here, I'll just go on here. Should be increasing from there to there and 6.691 to seven. And it should be concave down. Oh, I missed a little bit of concave down, didn't I? Did I? No. It should only be concave down where, oh, it's our function, concave down. That would be from like right there. So yeah, it looks like we did this accurately. So again, sorry, I didn't get to prepare that better, but I just figured I would show you that there is a way that it's possible to get g of, or the original function f of x out. And in doing so, it looks like we did in fact find all the correct values. So there is a calculator active version of the work that we've been doing. Okay, well that's enough work out of me, and that's enough examples that we've done kind of together. So instead what I'd like to invite you to do is I would like you to move forward and work through a single try. So I'm hoping this is large enough for you to read the values. Basically I have pre-graphed a function for you um, using Desmos so that, that way you could see very clearly where all the relevant points are. And what I'd like you to do is using that graph of f prime of x, and of course I should probably point that out right here, sticking with today's theme. Given that graph of f prime of x, I'd like you to find the x coordinates of the points of inflection and explain why they are, where f of x has a relative minimum and why, and where f is both decreasing and concave down. So three questions to answer. Again, you'll have a few minutes here once you pause the video. And once you've done that and worked through that, 
we can come back and I'll go over the answers really fast before letting this lesson end. So if you haven't already, please pause the video now. Welcome back. So hopefully you already paused the video. If not, please do it really quickly because we're about to look at the answers to this question. So in this question, again, you were provided a nice firm graph of the function f prime of x, so the derivative of some function f, and you were asked to use it to analyze the behavior of f, some function that we can't see. So the first question asked about the points of inflection. We know points of inflection occur where f prime changes between increasing and decreasing. So there occurs one down there, one right there, and one right there. And those three values are as given over on the left side, 2.241, 4.529, and 8.524. And again, the reason is because f prime changes between increasing and decreasing. That's the same thing as saying f changes concavity or f double prime changes signs. So for part B, you're asked where f has a relative minimum. Now again, keep in mind it's easy to like look at this and want to find those low spots, but a relative minimum given the graph of this, f prime of x, which again I probably should have labeled on this page too, given that this is the graph of f prime of x, you're looking for a place where f prime changes from negative to positive. Because if we think about it, if f prime goes negative to positive, remember that f must go from decreasing to increasing which matches exactly what a relative minimum would look like. So the only place where that occurs is right here at 3.404, and the justification is provided. Now, if you are interested, there is a second way to do this. Like the technique that we used for justifying this was using the first derivative test, f prime changing from negative to positive. Technically, since f prime is increasing at x equals 3.404, you could also state that f prime of 3.404 equals zero, and f prime is increasing. Therefore, f is concave up at 3.304, a critical number, and concave up at a critical number means a relative minimum. So you could also use the second derivative test if desired, but truthfully, in the last three years, I've had exactly like one student do that. So, you know, something that's out there, but again, it's up to you. Finally, for part C, you're asked where f is both decreasing and concave down. So two properties here. For this one, I'll actually pull out a different color pen just to make it clear. So two things to look at. First, if f is decreasing, f is decreasing, we want f prime to be negative. So f prime negative is our first move. So f prime is negative down here. And of course, all of this going forward. And then second, in addition to f prime being negative, since we want f to be concave down, we also need f prime to be decreasing. So we're looking for the section where f prime, this graph of the slope, is decreasing. That occurs on the first section and this section. So given that information, we can quickly find our region. It's 0 0.92 to 2.241, and then second from 5.412 down to 8.524. And those give us our two regions where both properties are happening. So, so one of those questions, in fact, here, just so you kind of pointed out, that's the question I like to ask. It's a really efficient question because it allows you to check a couple different things all at once. And you'll see a few of those questions on your problem set tonight. So with that said, that completes our lesson for the day. I don't want to keep harping on the same thing. I'd rather give you some opportunity to talk about it, like discuss it, ask some questions if can, and then work on the assignment a little bit and start practicing and getting comfortable with this skill. Um, a couple things to point out. The video solutions tonight, I did more problems than normal. I tried to cover almost every single question. I think there's only like two or three that I didn't do. So hopefully that'll support you if you're feeling confused. Like, make sure you check your work after you finish like a complete problem or if you start to feel a little stuck so that we can make sure you're on the right track. And then finally, other than that, let's just do a quick little review of what our technique was from today, what it was we were doing. So we started out by talking about the fact that normally when we analyze f, we have a really clear picture of f itself or we know what the function is, giving us kind of a leg up. But in fact, that's not the type of work that we did today. Instead, we focused on indirect characterization, where we took information about a function given indirectly by its derivative. Using all our definitions, we saw f prime is in common for all of them, and then we made that our goal, to use f prime of x in particular, particularly in graphical form, to understand what f of x is doing and how it's behaving over a course of certain intervals. After that, we went and analyzed the complete function f of x using all of its properties, only using f prime of x as a tool, and specifically the graph of f prime of x up there did that for a while. Then we went through and actually sketched out what f of x would look like given that description. And after using Desmos, we saw that it was a fairly accurate depiction, if not a perfectly scaled one. 
Beyond that, we used our graphing calculator to answer the questions uh, in similar ilk. Given information about f prime, we were able to kind of go backwards and find some stuff. We just had to use the calculator rather than simply counting out points. And then finally, I gave you a try it where you worked your way through and you were given some values, but otherwise you're doing much the same work that you were doing before. So really, I think you're ready to go for the day. Otherwise, feel free to talk about it and get things ready. Again, wish I was there to answer your questions, but in your absence, hopefully this has been helpful. And thank you for listening throughout this entire unit. And thank you for your hard work today and your hard work in preparing for the exam coming up in the next week or so. So thanks again. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. Goodbye.